Hi, this is Kenneth Johnson, known to my friends as Kenny, creator of V and uh, director of Short Circuit 2, uh, among lots of other things, and you are listening to The Movie Raid. It's time for The Movie Raid, and tonight's victim is director, producer, Kenneth Johnson, who's done many things, such as Short Circuit 2, the V series, the Incredible Hulk series, amongst many more. What's going on? Hi, Mike. I'm delighted to be on The Movie Raid and uh, have a chance to talk to you guys and your audience. What have you been up to? Um, well, we've been, uh, for the last, uh, oh, a little couple more, about about two years, uh, trying to get the funding in place to do V, the movie, which would be a big, they say, a major motion picture, based on my original uh, four-hour miniseries of V, and uh, it would be the first of a trilogy, which would uh, uh, subsequently be followed by two movies based on my novel, V, the Second Generation. And I, I had offers from, uh, I was a lot of very generous overtures from a lot of the major studios uh, in town when uh, they discovered that I owned the rights to, to V. And uh, they were very flattering, and I appreciated it a lot, but uh, uh, I was a little nervous about losing control if I went through a studio, uh, through the studio system, and it was very important for me to retain, to remain in the director's chair. And so I, I politely said no to them, and at which point all, all of them said, yeah, yeah, we understand. How much money do you really want? You know, <laughs> and, uh, and I had to explain to them that no, it wasn't about money. Uh, I had never gotten into this business from the beginning to, to the idea of, oh boy, I want to make a lot of money. I, I've always been involved in things that I really cared about, and the money, fortunately, has come through sometimes, not always, but, but I've never regretted the fact that I entered the business uh, out of a desire to be a storyteller and to, uh, to get my ideas and thoughts uh, out to an audience uh, rather than you know, how much money somebody could make off of it. I think I probably turned down more work than I ever could have accomplished and, and certainly turned down a, a lot of money that I, <laughs> that, uh, it wasn't, wasn't the right move for me soulfully. And um, so, you know, with things like Walker, Texas Ranger, which they asked me to create and, uh, uh, and which would have made uh, certainly a pot full of money, I said, gee, no, I, I don't know quite how to write for a guy that has the personality of a tree stump. I, I just, <laughs> you know, it's... Uh, couldn't get my heart into it, so uh, I decided not to go that way. But we're, uh, we've are we been close a couple of times to getting the full $60 million that we need uh, for V, uh, the movie, and working at it on a daily basis. How do you think people are going to react to this? It, since we're in the future, and compared to them, they loved it then, you think it's going to be like an off-and-on type deal, or do you think it's going to be a huge hit? Well, the beauty of, of my original creation of V is that it really is a timeless story. Uh, I mean, it really has its roots in Spartacus and the revolt of the slaves or, or the American Revolution or, or apartheid or any situation uh, that where, where people, good people are oppressed by a uh, totalitarian or tyrannical regime and determined that they're going to fight back. Uh, and because of that, it's, uh, there's a timelessness to it. Even when it, when it aired originally in 1983, 84, there was nothing in it that put it in a particular time frame. There was, there was actually there was only one line in it which re referred to a current uh, pitcher on the L.A. Dodgers at the time, and I only put that in as a sort of inside joke for, between me and Brandon Tartikoff. Brandon was a huge Dodger fan, and so I uh, I threw him a little uh, uh, a little bone there. But other than that, uh, you know, if you see the miniseries today, there's nothing that places it in the mid '80s. Uh, we even tried to be more classic with the kind of clothes that people wore and hairstyles and everything, so that it didn't uh, it didn't put itself planted in a time. And so we are, and, and also the, there's a huge international following for V. Uh, I get letters and emails from people all around the world on a literally on a daily basis. Um, far more than I've ever received from all of my other shows put together. V has just this enormous following, and we are very, very confident that uh, uh, if we make it, they will come. Television, do you think it's more of a mar more marketable than anything else today? Well, uh, you know, I, the bottom line is there are very few brand name international projects. There, there's very few things like V which have an instant recognition for for, uh, for people around the world. And, uh, I mean, if you, if you Google V or V visitors or something to that effect, you get something like 70 or 80 pages of links uh, on Google. And uh, uh, it, it's, it's, just, it's amazing. I mean, there are, there are sites on Facebook, dozens of sites on Facebook. One of them I know uh, out of uh, some fellows started in Liverpool 
has over 40,000 people on it. And, uh, and that's just one of the many, many, many websites in, Fra- in England, France, Germany, Spain, uh, Argentina, Brazil, uh, Japan. It's, it's, it's an, it was an amazing phenomenon from the, at the beginning, and it has never ceased to be. So uh, that, combined with the fact that, uh, that it's the beginning of a trilogy, and it leads into material that people haven't seen on the screen yet at all in any way. But also my desire to do it as a big movie was partly to fulfill the, the vision that I had originally of the uh, mic. But the problem was, in the, when I did it originally 30 years ago, I didn't have the money or the budget or the time. And most importantly, I didn't have the tools that I needed. The visual effects uh, was really at its infancy at that time. And, uh, uh, and you, you just didn't have the freedom with a camera that you have nowadays. Uh, also, visual effects makeup. Uh, I mean, I was working with the same people that George and Steven were working with, George Lucas and Steven Spielberg, uh, but we were all using, you know, prosthetic rubber masks with uh, air tubes blowing into them. I mean, it was goofy. Um, and the uh, the visual effects were, were also, I mean, this was before CGI, before you could do magical things. Um, and as far as the makeup was concerned, I mean, nowadays, look, you can take the nose off of Voldemort and uh, you can do pirate to the Caribbean. It's amazing uh, what what can be accomplished, and uh, so the idea of, of bringing the story and visually into the 21st century was very exciting. The core of it, the the human drama, the conflicts, and the emotions that drove and made it so successful to begin with, they haven't changed and they won't change. And uh, and certainly I have had to do some uh, refreshing of the script in order to bring it into the 21st century. I mean, there was no internet uh, when we did it before. There was uh, there was no terrorism situations going on. Uh, so all of that had to be dealt with, and, and we have. Uh, it's a very exciting uh, prospect. Now, as a director, though, uh, from from a director's stance, when when working as a director, do you think there are any actual boundaries, or as far as limits go, or is it just limitless to you? Oh no, I, I think that you know more and more. I mean, again, our imagination often outruns the the technical problems. That's what happened with V with me when I, you know, there were there were visual effects, uh, a few couple of visual effects shots involving spacecraft flying and such that we did in the original V that cost about seventy five thousand dollars for about twenty seconds of film, and you could do it today better on your cell phone than I could than I was able to do it then. And I hated it then. I knew it. I mean, I I just cringed when I saw so many of the visual effects uh, in the show, although they were state-of-the-art at the time and got huge response from both the public and the critics alike and how exciting and groundbreaking and all of that they were. But but it wasn't what I saw in my head and what I wanted to see. And uh, But the beauty of it is nowadays I can accomplish and get it to look the way that I want to look. Uh, the, the performances of the actors from the original picture, though, uh, one of the best days I ever had in my life was when I first saw our first rough assembly uh, that the four different editors had been working on. Uh, and nobody had seen the whole thing, and we sat down and screened it. Uh, And this was before there were any visual effects in it at all. No spaceships, no laser beams, no matte paintings, no motion control, nothing. It was just the, the actors working, and it took your head off because emotionally it was so powerful, and the performances that I'd managed to get from all of my wonderful actors were just spot on all the way through and uh, and I knew that once we added all the visual effects and such it was that was just going to be the icing on the cake but the core the the meat of the piece was always in the actors performances and uh, and certainly in the movie I would be working with a whole new set of actors but the text is is very similar in many ways uh, many of the lines even uh, are, are from drawn from the original um, and there are a few new characters as well but uh, but the core of it uh, and the emotional locks that it just provides with an audience uh, uh, haven't changed and you know I think it'll be it'll be really it'll be great fun to do and even greater fun to watch an audience react to it are you bringing some of that old school into the new school uh, well I, you know I, I don't know that, that I would call it old school I mean I think that V was partly can see I, I, I had a classical education at, at Carnegie Mellon it was then Carnegie Tech uh, the drama department there 
which was very very prestigious drama school uh, when I was there, and uh, uh, and we we studied all the classics from the Greeks on up, and uh, and I brought that sort of classical training to uh, all of the projects that I have done, and I think that's part of the reason that I, I've had uh, a fair amount of success, and some of the shows have even really become sort of iconic. Uh, it's because I was able to give them a kind of a classical underpinning and uh, solid, uh, I mean, good solid dramaturgy hasn't changed for a thousand years. Uh, it either captivates you or it doesn't, <laughs> you know, and if it does, uh, then uh, it's, you know, it's very exciting to, to see an audience reaction. But uh, so I, you know, the, the new movie of uh, V would be, would follow those same classical traditions and uh, and at the same time, I think very compelling to a contemporary audience. I mean, we got the new age happening and it could, always, it could be, for something like this, it could be a huge hit, who knows? Mm-hmm. You never know because the viewer is technically is the critic, regardless of how how you want it. To be. Well, that's true. And again, you know, a lot of the studios had in in mind of doing a you know a two hundred million dollar summer tentpole kind of thing, and and I was really fearful that the the the, the, hor- the tail would start wagging the dog, and they they didn't understand that that V was never an invasion movie. You know, uh, V was a story about occupation. V was a story about the tensions and the drama and the suspense of not knowing if the person you were sleeping with uh, was going to turn you in for something, or your children getting involved with the, the youth organization might suddenly uh, start pulling strings and uh, and taking out on you <laughs> things that kids always have against their parents, and you know, and and informing on them behavior that the uh, the ruling government would not find happy. Uh, so you know all of those uh, all of those elements uh, are, are are really really strong and they're again they're classical elements that uh, that help to give a, a depth and a strength to the project. No, yeah. have you have any other projects other than this, or is this pretty much your main baby at the time? This is the main thing I've been focusing on. I've got uh, two or three other f- uh, film projects. Uh, some people have been talking to me about another miniseries idea that I've had and been nurturing for a while. But my focus has really been on uh, on trying to get the movie made, and, and we only need about sixty million dollars to make it. I I don't need the 200 million that or 150 or whatever the studios were talking about. Per, 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 partly because you know a good third of whatever money the studios are talking about gets pumped back into the studio. You know you end up buying carpets for a lot of studio executives and fuel for the jets. And uh, I've been down that road. And uh, when you make a movie for 60 million dollars, it has a lot better chance of making a profit for our investors. And 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 so it's uh, it's really a, a good place to be. And we're uh, we're very excited about it. And you know hopefully we'll be able to, to line it up. At the same time, uh, it's very difficult to set up a an independent picture at that budget range most independent pictures are thought of to be in the you know 10 to 20 million dollar range when you're talking three times that you know it's a steep uh, it's a steep hill to climb but but we've got a lot of people that are interested and um, i'm gonna keep pressing until it gets done yeah big budget and low budget it's sometimes it's better to be low budget because it, it could also be a huge hit as well because it just depends how, how you manage that film that, that's that's it i mean the beauty of v is that it it's it's not an unknown property it is it is very well known around the world uh in spite of the fact that they've made a number of failed attempts to try to uh do it as a, as a television series when the most recent uh, version of that came on the good news for us who were trying to get the movie made is that the first night uh that it was on the air the night that the television show premiered it got really good numbers about 15 million people tuned in but they were only there for one week because as soon as they saw it and they said oh wait a minute <laughs> this isn't what we wanted to see they tuned in because they wanted to see more of v but not the v that they were given because it had nothing to do with my characters or storylines it was very very different and uh, and just obviously it didn't work and the audience knew it they tuned out and they just kept tuning out until finally the show was gone yeah that could always be a problem even with, with films itself it's like they'll make a an existing franchise but then it's like it can be high hopes but then very disappointing at times to- oh that's times. true i mean even a year before uh, they attempted to put uh, a remake of v on the air they tried to resurrect my bionic woman and uh, and before it went on the air uh, the president of warner brothers television told me that it was tracking uh, higher than any show show ever in the history of western civilization you know it was going to be this humongous hit and i said but but have you seen the pilot and he said no no but it doesn't matter i've seen the numbers the numbers are fantastic they're through the roof and i said but have you seen the pilot no 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 i haven't what difference does that make and i said what well, the difference that makes is that i have seen the pilot and it doesn't work you know uh, david ike is a really talented guy uh who was the guy behind it but 
it missed. It was not right. It didn't have the, the humanity, none of the humor. Certainly it didn't have the actress that I had, and it didn't have the heart that the original Bionic Woman had. And again, it went on the air the first night. Big numbers, 15 million people tuned in. The second week, a third of them went away. The third week, another third of them went away, and the new Bionic Woman was canceled in seven or eight weeks. Uh, and it's and I got to say, David Ike is a stand-up guy in my book because when it did crash and burn like that, he was the first one to say in several interviews, you know, we never figured out what the show was about or how to do it, and it didn't have any heart and. You know, I mean, he said every exactly everything that I spotted when I saw the pilot. And I thought it was really, really noble of him to be able to stand up and say, we blew it. We all don't even have the, the guts to even say that anymore. It's like, okay, we'll just move on. I have no recollection of that. I don't know what's yeah, going right, on. Yeah, right, right. Well, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. It must have been their, their problem over there. No, no, I'm sorry. When you when you screw up, you got to stand up and take your hit. Take your hits just like you get to stand up and take your, your praise when uh, when you have something that's successful. Look, your other projects, let's say they, they bombed. I mean, how, how would you react to that per se? You move on from that? Oh, well, yeah, you have to. I mean, I've had certainly my share of, uh, of stuff I, uh, that, that did not succeed. But generally, in television, it was not because the, the quality wasn't good, uh, because uh, the, all the stuff that I did, have done in television, has fortunately been reviewed and uh, critically pretty well. But uh, like back in 1986, for example, <coughs> I, I created a show called Shadow Chasers. It was about two guys investigating unexplained phenomena. One was a sort of a reporter for a National Enquirer-type uh, newspaper, and the other was an academic who just didn't like any of this business at all. And it was very, yes, it was, it was the X-Files, but it was five years before the X-Files, you know, oh, yeah. and, uh, and it also had a sense of humor. And we got tremendous reviews uh, from the piece, but they put it on, ABC did, opposite uh, Bill Cosby and Magnum, when both of those shows were absolutely at their peak of success and you know that we didn't get any ratings so they canceled the show after about 13 weeks as they had canceled every show that had been tried in that time period for several years and for several years after we as a matter of fact ended up having the highest ratings in that time period that abc had had for for years and years and years but uh but you know it was uh it was strictly a situation of the it was the bad time period and and that and that's happened to me several times uh you you never know how you know what the luck of the draw is going to be like uh but you go in and do the best job you possibly can and and fortunately the the critics have always loved it but unfortunately there have been many times when the studios and the networks have just put them on in the wrong time period and you know or in short circuit 2 for example the motion picture i did in uh, in 87 88 i uh, fisher stevens was was in the original picture and a wonderful wonderful actor won an academy award a couple of years ago for being the producer on the cove a uh, terrific guy but you know, he, in the original movie, they had Steve Gutenberg and Ali Sheedy, who were not big stars, but at least they were really recognizable names. And when they asked me to do this, the sequel, I said, well, who's going to star? And they said, well, Fisher's going to star, and, and the robot is going to star. And I said, no, no, wait, 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 <laughs> wait, guys, that doesn't work. You know, and I kept saying, you've got to put a star in here. They just didn't want to spend the extra money. And so the movie opened, and it did pretty well, actually. Yeah, but I knew in my heart of hearts that it could have done a lot better and drawn in a bigger audience and made more money for the studios and, and everybody involved uh, if they had listened to me and uh, let me bring in a uh, you know somebody with a little bit bigger name. But uh, in addition to Stiff Fisher, I would uh, Fisher always would have had the, the role that he had. But uh, you know it was it was not to be. And you know and all you can do is uh, is do the best you can do every single time and put your heart into it. And uh, and if it works, then that's a delightful thing. And if it doesn't work, you say, okay, well, what's next? And when you enter the, the world of show business, you have to acknowledge the fact that you are, you are a gypsy. <laughs> you know, you are entering a gypsy business where one day it's, it's feast and the next day it's famine. Uh, and that's the way it goes. And the, the idea is just to try to keep your batting average, you know, uh, above 500. If you can hey, do that, that's terrific. And, uh, and win a little bit more than you lose. And, and you know, I've, I've always been very content and never had any regrets of the shows that I have turned down or uh, the projects that didn't go quite the way that I wanted them to. But somebody, uh, I got a question from somebody the other day saying, what was the show that you absolutely didn't like the most doing? And I went back and I realized there was never a show like that. I enjoyed every single one of the projects.
projects that I did, uh, and I knew I was going to enjoy it going in, or I wouldn't have done it because life's too short to be doing bad stuff. And uh, I mean, you know, you can make a lot of money doing movies, movies like Saw and uh, really ugly, violent stuff. And I've turned down a lot of stuff like that. Uh, the original RoboCop came across my desk years and years ago, and I said, Nah, it was it was the script was really mean spirited and ugly and ultra violent and uh, and and uh, and underneath there was a really a, a germ of something that could have some humanism in it and i said look can i take this script and turn it into something a little more than just a slasher and smasher picture and i said no no that's what we want to do and i said well no then i'm not going to do it and my agent at the time went crazy so oh my god you're going to make a hundred million dollars this movie and i said yeah i'm afraid it probably will and he said well, yeah but then you can do anything you want and i said yeah, but I will have made that movie, <laughs> you know, and I just didn't yeah. want to put that vibe uh, out into the world. I would rather not make something that's, that's ugly and violent and mean-spirited just because of money. No thanks. You have your own priorities. So you, if you feel that you can't, you feel like that that's the way you want to do it, then don't do it, man. That's right. Because your name is going to be attached to that regardless. It's going to hit out there. and uh, it, That's right. You can never take your name off of it once it's on there. I, when I was at Universal a couple of times, they came to me and with a lot of really crappy ideas. And uh, and they said, well, look, okay, look. They said, you don't have to be involved. We just like to put your name on it. And I said, wow, wait a minute. What are you <laughs> talking about? If you put my name on it, then everybody will think I'm involved, and that's really bad because particularly if it's a project that's that i disagree with uh, you know emotionally and spiritually and uh, human humanitarianly humanistically i guess would be the right word uh, they said but yeah but you'll make all this money and i said mm, thanks guys i would like to make a lot more money than i make but i uh, uh, not at the not at that cost yeah well speaking of it, going back to the short circuit we do have a submitted question here sure and Sean asked, would you consider on making a sequel? And if so, what would you change about it? Uh, to Short Circuit 2? Yes. Um, the uh, Well, first of all, I put a bigger name in it, obviously, as I mentioned. But uh, there has been uh, a lot of talk over the years of trying to do a Short Circuit 3. Uh, David Foster, who produced both of the first two movies, has been laboring on it for, for uh, a decade, I think. And they've gone through several writers and several scripts. I've not seen any of them. They tell me that, once again, it's stalled. They just can't seem to uh, to get it right, and they feel that the old uh, Johnny Five to try to bring that particular robot back would need to be would be a mistake. They needed to upgrade him and all of that and make him look different. And, and as soon as I heard that, it was like no, <laughs> you know. The, what people loved was the fact that he was funky and that he was sort of slapped together, and uh, he was clearly a, a robot and he wasn't CGI and he was in the really really in the room with you. It was fascinating to watch people. They'd come to visit the set, and the puppeteers, uh, Gordon, Gordon uh, Trish, and uh, Rob, who, who uh, operated and performed Johnny Five, they'd be standing ten feet away, but and operating the robot. But people would be totally talking to the robot, you know, because he became a total a live character and he cuz they, they could ad lib with him it was fabulous and as a matter of fact it was very strange when the movie was over when a, when a project is over usually you've made friends and and you stay in touch with them over the years and you call them up later on and, and like that and and I do still I've talked to Rob and Gordon and Trish many times over the years since we did that when the movie was over Johnny was gone you know it was like a friend had died because without the three of them working together there was no Johnny Five, and uh, and I really I really went through a period of mourning where I really felt a loss. Uh, and I I, I was at uh, Eric Allard's uh, uh, effects shop. Eric's the brilliant guy who built Johnny to begin with. And we were doing a Alien Nation that caused to go over to Eric's shop, and I was walking through one of the back rooms, and I saw standing in a corner Johnny Five, and I had to look away. I I just couldn't. You know, I couldn't go there. It was a bit like going to a funeral where there's an open coffin, you know. <laughs> and you look in, and there's the person that you used to know, but it's not really, and they're really dead. You know, and, and that's the feeling that I had when I when I just happened to glance at him in that uh, in that warehouse. I, it was like, ow, oh, I can't go there. So it was a real loss after he went went away. Yeah, but I mean, that that's that's pretty sad. I mean, but but the best best thing is it's like he warmed a lot of hearts. We're like rooting for the robot to win. Well, oh, absolutely. Well, that was the thing. I mean, when they, when Jeff Sigansky at TriStar first asked me to take a look at the script, uh, I did, and, and it was it was very funny. It was a lot of big sight gags and all that, but I felt that they were using Johnny Five rather like a prop 
to get jokes off of rather than really mining. I said, Jeff, you've really got the elephant man here. He said, what are you talking about? It's about a little movie about a robot. I said, yes, but Johnny Five is, is like the elephant man or Quasimodo in the Notre Dame uh, by Victor Hugo, where people see the surface and they can't see through to what's underneath because the surface becomes too repellent or is a stereotype or whatever. And uh, I said, let me rework the script a little bit so that we can really mine all the humanistic aspects of it about the fact that inside this strange exterior, there's a pure soul burning alive, as there was in The Elephant Man and, and in Quasimodo. And I, and I said, I won't lose any of the humor or the, or the jokes and, and the gags and the, the visual stuff, but we'll have a movie that will have audiences not only laughing but crying because they get so emotionally hooked up into Johnny, and that's what we did, and that's exactly what happened. It was amazing to sit in the middle of an audience and listen to them crying as Johnny was being beaten or as he was dying. It was, it was really compelling stuff. I was very, very proud of what we did. Yeah, and you can almost even compare it to real life. If you watch that film, that's pretty much how it is. Yeah, you're right. That's again. That that's it. Because in in a strange way, uh, a movie about a robot is really a movie about humanism and what it means to be uh, a whole human being. Yeah. Uh, go ahead and plug in anything that you would like to share with us. Oh, there's nothing really except to thank all of my friends out there uh, who may be listening, who have been fans of uh, of my work over the years. I mean, as I said, the whole reason I got into this business was to uh, was to entertain people and to tell them stories and and to make them. Th- think. Uh, I, I, that's one of the things I try to impress upon my uh, filmmaking students when I, I teach uh, occasionally around the country at the New York Film Academy here and uh, UCLA and USC and the English National Film School and also uh, actually at the State University of Moscow. That was a great experience too. Uh, and one of the things I, I really try to emphasize to them is the importance of, of what they choose to tell their stories about. I do mention the fact that, yeah, you can make a lot of money making scary, awful, ugly, slasher uh, horror pictures. Uh, You make them cheap and they make a lot of money, and wow, isn't that great? And my feeling is, no, it's not great. I I urge them to to look instead and to, to aspire after the works of, uh, of the great humanist filmmakers, uh, my favorite of whom being uh, the Japanese director Akira Kurosawa, who's uh, just unmatched in his ability to, uh, to touch on humanism. And his movie, The Seven Samurai, I think is probably the greatest movie uh, I have ever seen because it combines everything you want in a movie, action, adventure, romance, suspense, drama, comedy, uh, and, it's, and it's brilliant. And it's in Japanese, for God's sake. But it totally, uh, totally draws you in, and it, uh, just as the work of a lot of the work that uh, that Steven Spielberg has done, a lot of the work that contemporarily that like Ronnie Howard has done uh, in many different spheres, and certainly the work of the great uh, classic directors like William Wyler, people like that, and, and I urge all my film students to uh, to really try to use those as role models for uh, for what they would choose to do, and um, and to try to just make their audiences think and be better human beings for having seen their work. And there you go, guys. Kenneth Johnson, director slash producer, amongst others. Thanks a lot.